Well, welcome back, everybody. Our guest today is Panera Bread CIO, John Meister, somebody who teaches and inspires me every single time we talk. John, if you know him, normally shies away from doing these kinds of things. It's not his cup of tea. But after wearing him down, after about the seventh ask, knowing his story would be appreciated by many, he finally said yes. So thank you for that, John. When I think of John Meister, I think of the words humility, I think humanity, intentionality, and stability. And you'll see why as we unpack his story here in the next few minutes. Well, starting with the last point, looking at stability, John's career has spanned seven years at Accenture, followed by 15 years at MasterCard. And he's about to hit his 10-year mark with Panera Bread, which is just so incredible on so many levels. So John, according to the latest statistics on CIO tenure, I estimate you're in about your third CIO life. So welcome to Tech Whispers, and can you share the secret to success in these great companies? I'm sure a lot of it is luck. Um, some of it is having a great team, that's for sure. Um, I, I also think uh, some of the, the traits that we've installed into our team uh, has really made a big difference. You know, there's the theme you hear out of me a lot is the ownership. Right, we tr typically own the business problem with the the business sponsor, uh, and we think about solving it. We don't think about just applying a technology um, solution or a new technology to a problem. We think about owning that problem and solving the problem. And I I do think ownership goes a long way. It also over time builds this business knowledge in the technology team. Uh, we like to be seen as as a member of the business team, um, and and able to get after. Uh, solving those real world problems. I don't, I don't think um, we've ever thought of ourselves as order takers. You know, you've heard that all the time, legacy IT uh, order taker. I'm not sure I've ever acted that way. Um, I, I don't know that um, uh, I'm ever interested in doing that. I, I guess I'd be fine if it was in a restaurant taking your order. But um, the reality is we typically want to know what the business problem is. Uh, and let us help you think about that business problem. Over time, I, I, I believe that the technology organization at Panera has really become uh, someone that the business teams want to pull into their, their problems and give me ideas on how to help solve that. And I think moving uh, from that, that mode of order taking, I guess, to really being a business partner and owning the problem uh, has done, has done tremendous, made a tremendous difference over the years. I know a lot of your folks at different levels and they do show up different. You know, they just, they are wired different. Um, and everything you described, I've seen in them, you know, and so it's pretty, pretty special to see. And, you know, during your 10 years at Panera, I mean, you've had multiple CEOs, multiple C-suite changes yes. that can create some interesting dynamics, John. So how do you approach those situations, <laughs> new relationships, uh, things like that? So, uh, I have typically tried to sit back and explain the big picture, start with the big picture, then drill into what we're, we're doing uh, or what we're talking about. Um, I assume that I'm not trusted at all by a, by a new CEO. I'm fine with that. Uh, you don't have to trust me from day one. We'll just continue talking and talk through these things. Uh, the trust is built over time, right? So you, have, you show some vulnerability to build that trust. Uh, you come back and follow up on the things that you said you were going to um, and own the things that you said you were going to own. Uh, but we really try and, um, you know, all the new executives I have build a relationship with, um, establish trust, uh, follow up. There's also times where we're talking about, um, you know, something that's been traditionally this way or that way. I try and back up and say, you know, uh, you can do this a lot of times in crisis mode as well. You know, a year and a half ago, the situation was this. We thought this might be the answer. So explain that situational, um, uh, you know, the bias for making this decision at the time. What we didn't know and later became a reality was X. Uh, this is how we got into this position. Um, we all made that decision, right? We all own it. We all We all made it. It wasn't... Uh, you know, Susie or Bob, um, we made it together. Uh, this is how we got into it. Uh, and this is how we're getting out of it. 
So, so I think a lot of that type of scenario, um, you know, where you describe how we got there in the big picture helps tremendously. Mm-hmm. And of course, the ownership side of it, which we talked about. Well, and you've done that. I mean, I think you actually surprise your CEO sometimes when you take, uh, you take the sword and you kind of surprise them, right? With, uh... I do. I do. Yeah. I, I can remember, you know, we're having all these resiliency problems and the system is um, once a week uh, not, not maintaining resiliency and we're having performance problems or it crashes, right? And that's a really, that's a revenue impacting thing now. It wasn't when I started, but it is definitely noticeable now, right? Immediately. The cafes noticed the, the business volume difference. Um, you know, and we didn't have the funding for resiliency. Many people could throw their hands up and I didn't get the funding and, you know, not my fault. I look at that differently. I reflect on that problem and I didn't sell that scenario, right? I didn't spell out what would happen if we didn't invest in this piece of infrastructure or we didn't resolve this technology debt piece. Uh, so, so. You know, I spend time thinking about my role in that. Okay, I could have sold that better. Uh, and so my attitude is more, you know, we thought we could not make this investment. Turns out we were wrong, right? Um, I always always laugh too. We like to say we have X percent uptime, right? 99.9 or 99.99, all those type of things. But, but the problem is, is you don't, your systems don't crash in the middle of the night when no one's using them. They crash during the times of stress. So whatever you think is your window of downtime that's going to happen at the least um, popular moment, right? The time when you're busiest and the system's under duress. So so you have to think that way, right? Um, and if I don't spell that situation out, how does the rest of the executive team understand, you know, is it time to, re, you know, remove that technology debt or refresh this infrastructure or those type of things? That's my job to tell them when it's time to do that. So yeah, you typically flip that on your head. I love it. I love it. Ownership, extreme ownership. Uh, yeah. So John, I think about a lot of your stories and, and one of them that really resonated with me, with me was, um, I think it's when you knew you had arrived as a business leader. Yes. So you started getting pictures from your CEO from the cafe. You, you know the story I'm talking about? I do. Um, so every morning the CEO would use the app to order breakfast and get it on the way to drop his son off at school. And uh, he'd stop at the light, kick his son out. His son could come back with the order before the light turned green. I had a good day. Uh, if he had to pull into the parking lot, I had a long day. I had a long morning, certainly, because I would hear about <laughs> it. Um, and he ordered the same thing. I'd call the GM, you know, like, you're killing me here. Can't you, you know, help me out a little bit? And the GM would laugh like he, he's been around the block a few times. He's going to, he's ordering a bee green smoothie and a toasted plain white bagel. Uh, so, you know, the bagel's warm, smoothie hasn't separated. We're making it only after he orders it, right? He knows he's already, he's two steps ahead of you in this thinking. And I laughed. Um, and, and I would go about a week without hearing from him. And I'd think, oh my God, we finally arrived, right? We finally got this experience down. It's 25 seconds, right? Um, from the time you get out of the car to get your food and get back in the car. And I would time myself many times. Um, but it had to be that way every time. And he would change cafes on me all the time, those type of things. Uh, and sure enough, I'd get something again and it was a gotcha, right? Um, but we would go through this every morning. And there was a time where it had probably been three weeks since I'd heard from him. And I thought, maybe this is the time. And then I started to get text messages of, here's the toasted bagel I got this morning at this restaurant. I went to our different location and this is the toasted bagel there. I went to a third location. This is the toasted bagel I got there. And these pictures, the, the bagel was, one was dark, one was light, one was barely toasted. One had toast marks on it, one didn't. Um, and it became, you know, the inconsistency of our toasting of our bagels is terrible. I knew I had arrived. So I've owned this experience so much that he now wants me to own toasting, which, you know, I, I laughed because I thought I can go out and buy a $100,000 AI-enabled toaster uh, with, with uh, AI cameras on it and everything. Uh, that's not what he's he's going to want. 
Uh, so I went to Boston for my Friday's uh, meeting with him, standing meeting. And we had a poster and he had hit, I'm going to say 30 cafes and he had organized them from light to dark. And what are we going to do? So get the app services guys. Let's go back and look at, you know, the factory settings on these things. How do we, you know, let's get a, a color guide out there, send something through. If it matches this, turn it down a notch, if it matches this, turn it up two notches, whatever. But let's go out and, and adjust the toasters and see if we can't get back to some of the basics on the on the equipment. But that's when I knew the technology was no longer uh, our challenge. Yeah, you had arrived. You had arrived. Yes, that's a that's good right. thing. Good way to think about it. So, John, you know, uh, from past episodes, one of the fun things we do here is we pull in some people who know you well. We call it the mystery questioners. So yes. uh, we got three of them that were pretty enthusiastic about being part of this. So. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's listen to the first one and okay. uh, get to know you a little better through the eyes of people who know you so well. So let's roll tape on number one. Hi, John. With all of the complexities of technology today, how do you explain new technology concepts with senior leadership? That's from Anita Klopfenstein. I recognize the voice. I, I try to do storytelling, but um, it's not just that simple sometimes. Uh, we tried to sell some concepts a few times where it's a macro story around, you know, customers coming in from the cold and uh, blah, blah, blah. That That's great, but that's one customer, right? We need to talk about impacting a lot of customers or one restaurant GM versus all the restaurant GMs. So I think you have to really dial that back into uh, more micro moments and then talk about the scale of that. You also can't do the storytelling where you're talking about the three-year vision of five different things coming together. It has to be very singularly focused. We've done a lot around, um, you know, I remember describing AI and putting that into some of our sales forecasting. A lot of people thought, oh, that sounds great, but it also sounds very expensive. Okay, well, we start out with just getting a lot of data, apply some out-of-the-box modules, and then let's measure. Right? We can measure the last months of sales and uh, predict what today would have been as we see today happening and what is more accurate. And if we can start to you know, just shave a little bit here or make ourselves a little bit better there, uh, predict a few other scenarios, uh, those are the types of things you can, you can talk to. Uh, but it was, you know, when we started with the long story around a customer coming in and we've predicted this and it starts to really fall by the wayside. It was a little too futuristic. So the micro moments um, and then, you know, relating how that would be helpful. That's amazing. And you and Anita go back a ways. Uh, people who follow, she, okay. she was on the show a couple months ago in February and uh, you had a question for her, which was, which was fun. She used to work for you. She, she, in, in one breath, she talked about her current CEO boss and then, she then she talked about John being the best boss she ever had. <laughs> That's uh, a lot of flattery. Uh, I think Anita is an incredibly accomplished person. Uh, I, I can only imagine uh, achieving half of what she does in any given year. Uh, and I would think I would be very fulfilled. But, but um, uh, Anita, incredible person, incredible capacity for achievement. Uh, at the same time, probably had the worst first interview experience ever is we traveled to Boston together and then came home together. So imagine sitting next to your potential boss in the, you're in the middle seat of a plane sitting next to him for three hours. Had to that be miserable hilarious. for her. But that is hilarious. Yeah. Talk about getting to know somebody very well, right? That's I mean, right. Take a little trip. Yeah. Who sat in the middle seat? That's the question, right? It's <laughs> uh, poor Anita sat in the middle seat. Of <laughs> too good. Too good. Well, kind of building onto her, her question, um, Chat GPT, big buzz, big noise, a lot of uh, excitement, confusion. Is it bright, shiny? Is it not? Um, how would you describe that? And you probably already have to your to your C suite team and your board. Yeah, I've actually started to ask people, how do we, what do we think of this, and the, and how do we think of it? Uh, it's very inspiring, right? It's a very inspiring uh, technology. Uh, fascinating what we can do. Uh, and I've asked other CIOs, how are you thinking about it? What are some of the things you're, you're putting around it in terms of either controls or uh, standards, those type of things? 
I'm finding that there's not so many people that have thought about it yet. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in people that have put some constraints around it. We see people that have that have already started to take our pantry. Some of our employees have taken our pantry and said, you know, give me some ideas for new items that we could that we could build. Uh, we had a developer write some code with it. It turns out it, you have to spend some time really thinking about describing the code you want it to build, but it mm. builds some very, very good code. So we, we've done some poking around the edges, but I don't know that we have truly figured out uh, the great things it's going to do or the constraints we need to think about in the long run uh, with how we work with it. You can't let too much intellectual property out, right? right. Um, so, so how do you deal with it and, and how do you make the, the best uh, use of it? I think we're just scratching the surface. It's it's such an inspiring technology. So we'll see. As Tracy, my my longtime colleague and chief of staff and EA says, it's, it's these are interesting times yes. to be in. <laughs> yes, it for is. Sure. For we're sure. Not, we thought we were moving fast before. Something tells me we're about to be a lot faster. Buckle up. Yeah, That's buckle right. up. Yeah. So, so Anita had a, a very serious follow-up question, John, and I'm yes. dying for the answer. And she wanted to know, who makes the best sugar cream pie? <laughs> uh, that's easy. That's Wix. Uh, it's a little place in Indiana. You have to be from there to know it. Um, but if you're in Indiana, you can typically find them frozen in the grocery store. They're really famous for their peanut butter pie. Mm. Uh, I like the sugar cream, though. So peanut, you can get sugar cream only in Indiana. You can get peanut butter pie a lot of different places, right? You can go to a dessert place and get peanut butter pie. They are famous for, for peanut butter. Sugar cream is uh, something I can't describe, and it's fantastic. I love it. I love it. John, we have a second uh, mystery question for you. Somebody who's okay. known you a long time, so let's have some fun with this one. Tell us who this is uh, after you hear the question. John, you are one of the most resilient people I know and certainly confident in your style. Early in our careers, we were raised together, perhaps raised by wolves, but we had a chance to work together in a couple different companies. And we knew that you had to grow and become resilient or you were out of that line of business. Now that you are building teams, leading teams, and growing talent, what techniques do you use to grow resiliency in individuals and build resiliency in your organization? It's a great question from Gary Vonderhaar. Um, I do think we've been raised by wolves a little bit. Um, Went through a couple of lifetimes together. Uh, we started consulting together. We both went to MasterCard uh, together, spent a long time working with each other. There's a couple of things I tell my teams when we talk about resiliency and we have times of crisis. Um, it's, it's the least fun muscle to build. Uh, just like when you work out, uh, you have your least favorite exercise. Uh, you, you, Le the least fun professional muscle to build is resiliency because it means you have to go through crisis to get it. Um, or even if it's not crisis, it's times that are no fun. You get the sleepless nights, you get the pacing across the floor, you get the pains in the stomach. Um, so I typically, after the fire is put out, I try to spend some time reflecting. How could have I prevented this problem? Um, I've talked about riding in a car by myself for a few hours, driving with you know no music on or anything, just thinking and reflecting. Um, I, I, the quote I love around Einstein is, you know, his best thinking was in the bus, the bed, or the bath. I think he might have had that order differently, but I get a lot of inspiration in the shower. That's more idea thinking. I can never remember if I've shampooed my hair by the time I'm done, but uh, so you do it again anyway. But um, for me, spending an hour or two uh, reflecting quietly, how could have I prevented the problem? And you have to get to that mode where you think about how could have I played a different part in this? But even if it was, I didn't get the budget, okay, how could have I sold, how could I have sold that refresh project differently or whatever? Or, you know, it was a, it's a vendor software bug and we didn't anticipate it. Okay, but we could have reacted faster and made this part of the technology optimal or more redundant or whatever, right? And so uh, when you start thinking that way and then spend some time really diving into that, 
that's where you get your learning moments out of. And you have your aha moments, right? Um, rough seas make the best sailors. Just saying, uh, one of my direct reports has, um, we, uh, we have to reflect on what did we learn in that storm? So, you, A, you don't let it happen again and you really do build that resiliency into your you know, technology or systems. But then even for yourself, how, what was my role in that? What could have my role been to prevent it? And then how am I going to change accordingly? What are the other things I'm facing right now that I suspect I could apply this lesson to? I didn't sell this technology refresh. Okay, what's the next thing I should be worried about? And you really spend time drilling into mentally, how do you apply that lesson already? That's how you create those learning moments. That's how you create resiliency. Um, when you've been at this for so many decades, like I have, uh, you, you build it uh, stronger and stronger as well. And that's that to me is a highly valuable skill in life. It's also how you uh, get past regret and heartburn over things, right? You can get angry and say, this was done to me. Or you can accept some responsibility into it, reflect on it, and uh, choose, choose a different mentality and find yourself a lot happier when you wake up in the morning. Well, and you build a culture around that, too. It's pretty special, you know, and how your folks, you build that resiliency in your people and... I know you'll jump in your car and drive an hour, just get that think time and just right. clear, clear your head and get the noise uh, blocked out and always appreciate that. So, so speaking of culture, I want to talk about Panera Bread. And by the way, thanks to Gary Vondahar, great friend. And uh, he, was, friend. Uh, I think he was in Columbia when he uh, did the question. He's like, oh, yeah, let me, let me get this done for John. So uh, I loved uh, we were way, way, Raised by Wolves. It's beautiful. So speaking of culture, I just want to unpack Panera, the company, a little bit, and then also oh. Panera 2.0, because there's a lot going on there. And, you know, I think I've shared with you that I, I meet with a bunch of guys at Panera Bread here in Tulsa every Thursday morning. It's a, it's a little Bible study. Big shout out to Kyle and Jerry, John, Brett, Curtis, and James. And, you know, we know the people who work there. We thank them every morning. Fantastic. They're there, and they're awesome. Yeah. And we we see the police officer, and we see the old the old guys over on the side, and we not that we're young, but uh, Kasha, the young engineer from from Kimberly Clark, it's like it's like a family culture. Yeah, there, John. And something tells me there's some intentionality behind that. There is uh, the entire company. Uh, it really struck me when I when I came to Panera and started talking to people. It, it feels like a family. It's warm. It's accepting. Um, you know, we talk about. Um, the lack of tolerance these days, lack of tolerance around other opinions, all those types of things. Panera, we strive uh, to be different, right? All voices are heard. Um, you have you have respect. You have uh, the ability to be your authentic self as well as a result, right? Because there's, you trust that you're going to uh, still have these relationships. Uh, we don't always disagree. And that's fine. That's how we learn. Um, at the same time, it's also important that everyone has uh, the ability to maintain a sense of dignity, right? And even then, when we think about the food and the experience, we want it to be something where you walk away feeling better afterwards, right? Whether it was the food I ate, the quality of the food, I don't feel terrible about eating it, the experience shared with friends, the environment, all of those type of things. And I, I really hand it, uh, I tip my cap to the, the cafe GMs uh, that think about their teams as family, uh, really take care of their employees and their customers. Uh, the people that work in that cafe, they know their regular customers and it feels like family to them, right? And, and um, it is a friendly, warm environment. And that, that is really uh, served by, by the, uh, those cafe employees. There's many times where I apologize to them. We've had a technology issue, a customer's yelling at them for something that's my fault. Mm. Um, and, I, and I do appreciate the fact that they take the brunt of that sometimes. Um, or it's a cafe system where their employees are yelling at them uh, because we let them down, right? So, so there's many times where they're taking the brunt of, of the pain that we should be feeling. Uh, but... but um, at the same time, 
uh, we recognize they're our number one leader and we try and do everything we can for those restaurant managers. I love it. I love it. You know, just uh, just to give a, a little personal note here for those who are listening on audio and not watching on YouTube, I'm looking at John's skateboard in the background there. Uh, it's not unusual to see you going down the hallway on a skateboard or even a bike sometimes. So I have been known to tootle around the office and, and some kind of transportation. <laughs> I love it. So, John, you went there. It's 10 years. And uh, you went there 10 years ago to tackle the e-commerce. You thought you knocked out in a couple of couple years and uh, yeah. it'll be good. And so what what happened, John? What, uh, tell, us what, tell us about <laughs> their 2.0 and the journey. Yeah, there's so, so many great stories. I came here. Um, I got to know uh, when I was going through the interviewing, I wasn't sure I wanted to do this. Uh, I knew I could help. Uh, then I saw the renderings they had and how deeply they thought about the customer experience. And then it was, okay, I really want to go through uh, this project and this opportunity because it's very rare that you see an executive team that was really thinking about that customer experience in such micro detail and, and had so well thought out what the future should look like. And the user experience and the design and the efforts that have been put into it were amazing. Uh, so they had that customer experience vision down. What they didn't have down was the architecture and the infrastructure and the software development building skills. And I could bring that. I knew, I knew people who we could hire. Uh, I knew people that had the reputation like Anita. I didn't, hadn't worked with her, but I knew her reputation well. Um, and I knew that. She had the same mentality I did of owning it and uh, really getting getting your uh, your fingers dirty with um, every part of that detail. So uh, we started in. Um, I, I don't think anyone um, was expecting some of the things that we brought to the table. We started talking about the time frames we'd be able to deliver this on. I still remember the founder putting his arm around me and saying, "Stop promising." something that you can't do, right? It's only going to set you up for failure. Um, and at the time, it was rolling 2.0 out in the year. And I thought, a year is the eternity in technology time. Like, God, if it takes that long, I'm going to, like, you know, I'm going to shoot myself. If I don't shoot myself, Anita might shoot me um, if it takes us a year. So we really thought long and hard, right? And they would ask us questions. How are you going to, you're rolling us out to one or two cafes a night. How are you going to get it to 100 cafes a night? I don't know, but we'll figure that out. We've got a lot of smart people who have a lot of energy. Um, and we had some people that we had out of restaurant operations that saved that project time and time again when it came to the rollout. Uh, we also were never satisfied. There were so many times where we were trying to um, beat ourselves up and improving it. And it just, you know, felt horrible. And then, it, you know, okay, let's go back and ask these GMs, you know, is it so terrible that we should take it out? and rethink this and come back in a month or two and it became, no, 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 my God, this is the best thing we've ever had. Stop talking like that. Okay, you know, as a team, you hear that, you get a little bit more energized. Okay, we are onto something, this is gonna be great, but we still need to perfect, you know, this 1% edge case or, you know, the rainy day, got the kids in the backseat of the car, how do we improve this experience? So we really thought about long and hard some of those customer experiences and just kept at it, kept at it and kept at it. It was a relentless focus. My wife would tell you that that probably describes me in many things in life. Um, <laughs> it's hard to get me off of that track sometimes when I'm on it. Um, but, but um, it was staying at it day after day after day. And, and I would describe when we were recruiting people into this effort, a lot of people that we knew, um, when we bring them in, I, I would always tell them uh, there's there's two or three things that I have to be upfront about. Uh, you're going to be ex exceptionally happy. You can be authentic here. Uh, the company's um, goals and vision aligns with your values, right? And you want to make a difference. Uh, you want to see how you make a difference. You can go into a cafe and see what you did yesterday and how it impacts customers for better or worse. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes you much happier when you see the smiles, when you see the frustration, it makes you dig harder. Uh, 
The other challenge of that, though, is it's also make, making you put in more effort and more hours and you have to watch burnout, right? Mm. When you enjoy what you do and all the values align with what you believe and what you're doing, uh, you can work yourself uh, ragged and you have to have someone that's going to, you know, give you a little bit of balance and, hey, you need to take three or four days off and uh, get this out of your mind and I don't want to see you for a few days. Um, so there was some of that recognition too. One of the stories I, I've always appreciated, John, it's the, uh, the Fridays with the founder. Oh, yes. Would you mind, would you mind sharing that story? And, and Sure. So we would, um, every, two out of every three Fridays, I think I was in Boston, and we would go through different aspects of Panerati.o. And we might spend an entire day reviewing the app and the website or, you know, the, uh, we'd start with the iOS app and go next to the website or the catering website. And we'd spend two hours talking about the shade of green that we used in the app. And the entire time I'm, you know, I kept fluctuating back and forth. I would every now and then think I'm the technology guy, right? Just get a marketing person in here, choose the shade of green and tell me what shade of green you want to use. We'll have the engineers do it. We're the freaking engineers. We don't know art. We don't know, you know, font was something we spent hours and hours on. Uh, but the reality was, um, you, you know, my mind would flip and I would think about this differently. How, what other opportunity am I going to have to work with the founder of a company who's going to spend an entire day with me solely focused on this? And that, quite frankly, was a big reason for the success, right? Many people would walk away from this project because it was, the change management is too hard for the cafe. Mm. The change management for the customers is too hard. Um, yes, this is great, but it's, you know, figuring out how we're going to land this into a cafe, giving them very little training uh, and rolling it out to 100 cafes a night. That's hard, right? But having this intense focus all the way at the top and just going back through it over and over again of, I'm a dumb customer. I don't know the first thing about Panera. You know, um, how do you walk me through ordering food? Because when you're talking to a cashier, that's a cashier that takes hundreds of orders, right? And they're an expert. They're going to be fast at this. They know how to answer questions. They can see confusion on your face if you're debating between two items. They can describe something because they've tried it before. You know, you have to convey all that with this digital experience type of thing. Nowadays, we think about that after COVID. It's kind of silly, right? But at the time, no one was really doing this. You could order digitally for pizza, maybe some Chinese food for delivery. Was a lot of other options, right? And we were really groundbreaking on this. And we would put ourselves in those that customer shoes and really think, think about it. But it was long days uh, spending it through that. And you could, on the one hand, you could be, you know, miserable with the CEO going through the shades of green and, and, you know, getting beat up over the fonts that we were using, or, you know, this isn't intuitive, or you can look at that as an opportunity of when else am I going to get this brain power in a room to help me hone this. Right. And ultimately Fantastic. I think we, we, we made something very special as a result. Yeah. There's a reason why you were in that room of those two out of three Fridays and uh, often get home, didn't get home that night, that Friday night. Yeah. I would typically miss my plane home on Friday night. It got to the point where I knew that Burger King was my last food option. They closed at 11. Uh, <laughs> I have lots of respect for all the other restaurant companies. Um, I frequent many of them. Um, there's always something to admire, right? You can be jealous about something. There's always something to admire. Uh, but in Boston, restaurants close, stop serving food, even on a Friday night. Um, and I knew if I didn't get out of there at 1045, I wasn't going to be able to find anything to eat before I went to the hotel and then tried to get up at 4 a.m. and hit the first flight out on Saturday. Get a late flight out. Too yeah. funny. Well, you put the same care into the uh, associate team member experience, too. Those those mm -hmm. moments that matter. And I think our next, uh, our third mystery questioner might, might hit some of that. So let's listen in to our, our third and final mystery question. John, over the past five years, as the primary HR strategic partner, I received constant feedback from our associates that many enjoy working under your guidance and actually would have departed during unexpected headwinds to our business and to the economy 
if it were not for your leadership? What guidance would you provide to your successor to be viewed as a remarkable leader? It's a great question from Naomi, uh, my partner in crime these days. Um, I had to talk Naomi into coming back to Panera, actually, so she's very appropriate for this question. Uh, she left us, went on to do great things, uh, and then I had to convince her to come back at one point. Um, I, there's two or three aspects to this question I break down. First, um, we, from a talent management perspective, we really take a vested interest in people's success. Mm -hmm. I want to know what are the coaching points around uh, an individual, right? So you can tell me the three things they do great, but what's the one coaching point? Uh, we try to make an art of coaching points and coaching feedback as well. So, you know, what I appreciate um, is that, you know, you won't take no for an answer. However, it could be better if uh, you realize, you know, you have some culpability in the situation. I don't know, making that up, but appreciate how to make it better. Uh, it takes all the defensiveness out of it, typically. Um, and people want coaching. At the same time, I, you know, I know a lot of people uh, are going to work for us for a few years, uh, outgrow Panera or outgrow their role and not have necessarily an opportunity. Uh, and they'll move on and do great things in their career. Uh, and to me, that's very special. We've had, I've had a number of directs go on to be CI very successful CIOs other places. Uh, I don't expect them to work their entire lives for me. Um, uh, and, and I am energized by the fact that they go on to be great successes at other places. I hope they are far more successful than me. I hope that all of my people are far more successful than me. Um, but we, we really try and think about that from a, a growth and opportunity. And the reality is, you know, if every year I sit down and figure out, I go through my entire roster of employees who got a chance to do a new role, got a new boss, went to a new team, whatever. And anymore, we find 25 to 30% of our people are doing something different than they did at the start of the, of the year, mm -hmm. which is phenomenal. Uh, to me, moving people around, getting them more experience, um, and also finding out what they want to do, right? So many times I tell them lists, give me a list of the things you love to do and a couple of the things you hate to do. And then let's find a role where we maximize one column and minimize the other column. You can't always do the stuff you love and never do the stuff you hate, but we can certainly, you know, move people around a little bit. You can try some, some things and find out what you love. Well, I mentioned my introduction about your humanity. I think Naomi kind of, kind of opened that up a little bit with her question. So thank you, Naomi. And, I know she didn't use her last name because you're afraid someone's going to come and come and poach yes, her. Yes, I please don't poach her again. <laughs> HR business partner extraordinaire. She does a phenomenal job. So great She's job, team. You know, I've seen these things in action, John. You know, when when Lisa Nichols and I visit with you early on when we launched the Tech Galax Leadership Program, and we kind of explained it to you. I think it took about three and a half minutes, and you're like, "Oh, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. Right. Uh, I want I want my people to benefit from this." and you personally handpick people. I mean, you you know the people who are going through this program. My name, um, he's ready now, she's ready now. This will force him out of his comfort zone. That's right. We just yeah. talked yesterday about the ones that we were potentially nominating for the next one. And um, all of my direct reports nominate one. Some will be greedy and nominate two. Uh, we go through those. Uh, Naomi helps with this tremendously as well. Uh, and we go through and, you know, here, this will help them find their next opportunity here. This will get them out of their comfort zone. Uh, this is going to give them an ability to practice something that they don't get to practice. Maybe it's presentation. Maybe it's, um, you know, thinking about a project front to back, all of those type of things. It's, it's fun. You guys have done a great job with continuing to improve that prep, that, that program as well. You know, I sit down and try and get the capstone presentations for my team. Uh, one on one or a small group with with me, um, and I love it. It's so energizing. It's inspiring, right? It really, at the end of the day, uh, I get more out of that. I think some days from that presentation time with them than they do. Well, big shout out to you and your peers in St. Louis. Eighty five companies in St. Louis that are leaning in, right? Mentoring, yeah, that's uh, right. investing in their people, and uh, it's a great technology town. You know, people don't realize it. We have taken a lot of us, uh, we had a meeting this morning, 
many of the CIOs we talk about how do we keep the talent here? How do we grow more talent? How do we take the talent we have and make it better? Um, even though we kind of compete for talent with each other, uh, we often talk about um, the talent we've passed around with each other as well. And how do we how do we continue to build the next generation of great IT leaders? So, John, one of the things I know you're excited about is uh, you do a lot of great things in the communities that Panera serves and uh, nonprofits and your time and things like that. And you know the Tech for Good program, right? The, yes. the scholarships yep. to the Tech Life's Leadership Program. And so, yep. have you thought about uh, been able to narrow it down to one organization you'd like to gift a seat to? Yeah, this was very quick for me as well. Uh, it's Girls Inc. Um, we work with Girls Inc. here in St. Louis. Uh, we take four or five um, high school girls every year and do a little bit of an internship program. Uh, we get them exposed to information security. We get them exposed to some innovation, uh, maybe coding on a mobile app or a website, um, doing some project management, doing a, a various set of roles and have them really explore that for half a day and then talk about it for half a day. And we assign them you know, mentors uh, for each of those different roles um, while they're here. So um, fantastic program. Would love to gift uh, a scholarship for them. Uh, hopefully they can, of all the girls that graduate and go on to college and do great things, hopefully we can get one of them a little bit more exposed to technology. I always joke around. Cheryl Jones is our is the woman who runs Girls in Care locally. I tease Cheryl all the time. I would love to take some of those girls that aspire to be med school students and teach them to want to do engineering a little bit more, but uh, most of them go on to do great things. Uh, but if we do have one that's really into STEM, uh, hopefully we can we can help uh, help them get some contacts in the local group and uh, in, the, in the local community uh, that can help them, whether it's answer a question, get a job interview when they do graduate, all those type of things. Such a great organization. I, I appreciate that. And we're going to put them on uh, our social media posts and just kind of shine the light on them, put them on the website and so forth. So good great. stuff. And, you know, John, um, you mentioned innovation and, you know, we're going to, you and I are going to do a blog post together. Yep. It'll launch next week on CI.com. We'll unpack a lot of these things. And, you know, unfortunately we're kind of out of time, but my last serious question for you, uh, two, two prong favorite thing at Panera right now and what's coming. Can you, can you give us a little <laughs> insight? We talked about having love affairs with things at Panera. And so you have a love affair for a while and then you fall out of love with it. Right. I love uh, my, Every year I have a love affair with turkey chili for a while. It's only on the menu in the wintertime. Uh, it's healthy, tastes fantastic. Uh, the squash soup is another one that is truly very high quality. Uh, I love our new Asian crunch salad. It's fantastic. Um, uh, it, some of the new things we have, we've tested some frittatas at breakfast. Uh, they haven't done as well in consumer testing as we would have hoped. Uh, I still hope we bring them out there. Um, uh, Starbucks has the egg bites, which are okay. They're frozen in the microwave. These are made fresh for you. Um, and they taste it. Uh, they're fantastic. And we have three flavors. Uh, one of the consumers said there was too much bacon in the bacon one, which I can't understand how anyone would ever have that feedback. That could not be. Oh yeah. my gosh, right? <laughs> Uh, but I cannot wait until we get those rolled out. I'm so hoping uh, that the consumer testing goes well. Well, we'll be on the lookout for those. And uh, John, just thanks so much again for for being part of this, for sharing your story, so many good nuggets. And uh, we'll keep this going in your blog post for next week. Thank you, Dan. I'm so honored to to do this with you. Excellent. See you next time, everybody. Thanks so much. You've been listening to Tech Whispers, inside the playbook of the best digital leaders, a Woolet and Associates podcast. Keep connected with us by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you like what you've heard, please rate the show as this helps us connect the world's best digital leaders with those who aspire to learn, grow, and thrive in this amazing profession. Thanks for listening. Until next time.